in sections 8 and 9 of the antinomy, Kant returns to the four problems that he started out with, and he's going to tell us what the final, the final answers to those problems are. We've seen the principle of those answers already, right? It is that we have to make a distinction between, on the one hand, the phenomena, and on the other hand, the things in themselves. And once we understand that um, when it comes, for instance, to the eternity of the world, that we are talking about appearances, not things in themselves, then we can understand how it could be the case that there is no right answer to this question, because the totality of appearances is never given to us and has no independent existence. Okay, not all four conflicts, however, are going to be resolved in entirely the same way. Um, the first two conflicts are going to be resolved in roughly the same way, although Kant makes one terminological distinction here. Um, but the second two conflicts are going to be resolved in a somewhat different way, indeed in an importantly different way, because Kant thinks that this is the key to understanding human freedom. And so maybe the most important thing that happens in these sections 8 and 9 is section 9's discussion of transcendental freedom. Okay, let's get started with section 8. The regulative principle of pure reason in regard to the cosmological ideas. A regulative principle, um, which Kant opposes to a constitutive principle. Well, a regulative principle tells us how to act, how to proceed, how to do something. A regulative principle of pure reason tells us how to investigate the world. Um, on the other hand, a constitutive principle would state something about how, what the objects are, what they have to be. Um, what pure reason gives us, Kant tells us, is a regulative principle. It tells us how to proceed in our attempt to understand the world. So here we have at A509, Kant telling us that it is a principle of reason which as a rule postulates what should be affected by us in the regress, but does not anticipate what is given in itself in the object prior to any regress. Hence, I call it a regulative principle of reason. So basically, like the positive role of reason here is to tell us what to do. And so for instance, when it comes to objects in time, um, what reason tells us to do is to always look for an object that's further back, right? To always look for something that happened before the thing that we have last investigated. Um, it tells us that this is always possible, that we never have any methodological reason to say, no, no, this is the last thing, right? If we say this is the last thing, then we are not being, um, we are not doing justice to, to time in a sense. We are not doing justice to the way that, uh, that the understanding works. And so we shouldn't do that, right? We should always proceed, but that doesn't mean that at any point we can, you know, we have the totality of appearances and can make any kind of metaphysical statement about that. What Kant also does in section eight is he introduces a little piece of terminology which is going to be important or at least used in the first parts of section nine. Uh, and that is the distinction between two ways of thinking about eternity uh, or infinity, I should say. So at A512, Kant tells us that um, whether I can say here that there is a regress to infinity or only a regress extending indeterminately far in indefinitum, um, and whether from human beings now living I can ascend to infinity in the series of their ancestors, or whether it can be said only that as far as I've gone back, there has never been an empirical ground for holding the series to be bounded anywhere, so that for every forefather I am justified in seeking, and at the same time bound to seek still further for his ancestors, though not to presuppose them. Well, to this I say, Kant goes on, if the whole was given in empirical intuition, then the regress in the series of its inner conditions goes to infinity. But if only one member of the series is given from which the regress to an absolute totality is first of all to proceed, then only an indeterminate kind of regress in indefinitum takes place. Um, the best way to understand this is really to, and, and Kant actually basically already um, it gives away how he's going to use it. Um, the best way to understand this is to see how he is going to use it. 
And basically, like the easiest way to grasp the difference is to think about the difference between past time and the divisibility of matter, right? When I'm going to divide something like this, this, this little bowl, um, if I want to divide, like if I'm wondering whether this can be sort of divided, like the matter is divisible, um, well, the answer is yes. And everything that I'm ever going to need to proceed has already been given me, right? I already have this continuum of sensible uh, material, really, that, you know, I know in advance I can continue to divide and divide and divide and divide and divide, and it's all already here. And that seems to be what Kant calls a um, regress to infinity, whereas if only the first term would be given, and that, of course, happens, for instance, when I think about like let's say causes what calls biz right probably some kind of machine in i don't know i mean every sign on this is in a language i do not read so i don't know where it comes from um i'm not even entirely certain that they are signs well um you know it was probably made in some kind of factory and that factory was made by something and that was made by something and of course i i can always go a step further but this entire sequence of of causes reaching back into you know the most distant past that you can possibly think of that has not been given me and that is what kant calls a um, regress extending indeterminately far in indefinitum okay so let us go to section 9 and see how Kant deals with these four cosmological principles. Cosmological principle 1. The totality of the composition of the appearances of a world whole. This was about extending past time and extending space um, infinitely or finitely far. Well, Kant says... Can this be called a regress to infinity or only an indeterminately continued regress? We have basically already indicated this, right? Um, at A519, Kant tells us that I always have the world whole only in concept, but by no means as a whole in intuition. And that means that it is the second kind of progress, a uh, progress in indefinitum. Or a regress in indefinitum. Um, at A520, Kant then tells us that to the cosmological question about the magnitude of the world, the first and negative answer is the world has no first beginning in time and no outermost boundary in space, right? Because every moment requires me to ask for a moment before that. And everything in space, no matter how far, uh, you know, requires me to ask, okay, and what is beyond it? Now, this doesn't mean, of course, we already know this, that Kant is going to tell us that the world is infinite in space or that it's infinite in time, because that would require this infinity to be given to us as the whole of appearances, and it can never be given to us in, uh, in that sense. So what affirmative answer can we give? Well, at the bottom of A521, Kant tells us the affirmative answer is that the regress in the series of appearances in the world as a determination of the magnitude of the world goes on in, defini in indefinitum, which is as much as to say that the world of sense has no absolute magnitude, but the empirical regress, through which alone it can be given on the side of its conditions, has its rule, namely always to progress from each member of the series as a conditioned to a still more remote member whether by means of one's own experience or the guiding thread of history or the chain of effects and their causes, and nowhere to exceed the extension of the possible empirical use of one's understanding, since this extension is the sole and proper business of reason in its principles. This, I would say, is, is exactly what by this time um, we, we expect to find here, we expect Kant to say. All right, the second resolution, the resolution of, uh, of division, um, it's basically, it's kind of the same, except that here, and, you know, paragraph 8 has already uh, suggested to us, this to us, here we are going to have the other kind of progress, the progress um, in infinitum, because, and here we are uh, around the place where A524 begins, 
because the conditions, the parts, are contained in the condition itself. And since this condition is given as a whole in an intuition and closed within its boundaries, the conditions are all given along with it. So again, I mean, if I have this bowl, then sort of everything that I need in order to proceed with the division has already been given to me. And Kant but apparently thinks that this is this distinction is important enough to use a different term. Um, I don't think the term does does a lot of real work here. He goes on to say that despite this, it is by no means permitted to say of such a whole, which is divisible to infinity, that it consists of infinitely many parts. So again, we're not supposed to um, to affirm the anti-thesis. It's not, you can't say that it consists of infinitely many parts, for though all the parts are contained in the intuition of the whole, the whole division is not contained in it. Really, it's only um, something that we still have to do. This is basically what Aristotle calls a potential infinity. We can always go on and on and on and on, but we haven't done the infinite number of steps, right? We haven't divided it, um, and, and it's senseless to say. In fact, it takes appearances as, as things in themselves if we were to say that there are infinitely many parts here. Kant then spends a little bit of time to say that um, that nothing that although we know that matter is infinitely divisible, that doesn't mean that we know anything about what we're going to find. Right? We, we don't know whether we're going to find any complexity. Right? Whether if we look smaller and smaller and smaller, there's going to be all kinds of complex structures, or whether it's just going to be like total boringness, um, some kind of continuum fluid or, or solid that is just the same at every scale of length. Uh, why does Kant talk about this? I think he talks about this because Leibniz, in the monadology, in one of the, I would say, most beautiful philosophical visions uh, of European modernity, posits that even the minutest piece of matter contains worlds upon worlds upon worlds, um, full, of, full of everything, really, including more animals and plants, which themselves contain new worlds upon worlds. Um, and so there's, there's this infinite complexity all the way down, which Leibniz basically gets from the, um, from the infinity and perfection of God. But Kant says, you know, we don't know anything about that, right? Whether if you move into matter, you're gonna find, you know, new things, or whether it's just gonna be some boring, you know, extended stuff that's the same everywhere. Uh, we don't know that in advance. All right, we move on to the concluding remark on the resolution of the mathematical transcendental ideas and preamble to the resolution of the dynamic transcendental ideas. And what Kant is going to do here is he is going to explain to us the difference between the first two and the second two um, conflicts. So in the first two conflicts, here's the basic idea, in the first two conflicts, we know in advance that all elements of the series are going to be of the same kind, right? If I ask, well, what is after this space? Well, there's going to be a new part of space, right? Some new spatial objects and then some more spatial objects and some more spatial objects and so on and so forth. The same for time, the same for the divisibility, divisibility of matter. Well, you know, what do you get when you divide matter? Well, you get smaller parts of matter. Um, but it's all going to be the same kind of thing. Now, when we come to causes and when we come to um, substances and, 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 and sort of like, like this, this very abstract idea of, of something that conditions something else um, in its existence, Kant thinks, when Kant thinks about causation, he's mostly thinking about changes of, of attributes, right? Uh, and so we can ask about causation, which is about changes of, of, of something's properties. Uh, and we can ask about the existence of substances and, and what conditions that, right? What makes one substance exist? Maybe some other substance, I don't know. Um, well, when it comes to those latter two things, these chains of causes or these chains of, of conditions, um, there's nothing in the concept itself that requires all the elements of the series to be of the same kind. In particular, there's no requirement that they are all appearances. There is nothing contradictory in the idea that um, something might have a cause 
that is purely intelligible. That is not an appearance, that is a thing in itself. Because we can apply the concept of causation, not, not the schematized concept of causation, uh, but we can apply the concept of causation to things in themselves. To be sure, we don't have a deduction for that, right? We haven't got a transcendental deduction for that. We can't show that that this makes, um, we can't show that it's possible. We can't show that there is any um, causation from things in themselves. We can't even show that it's like possible in some real sense to have causation from things in themselves, but at least it's thinkable, right? It's thinkable uh, in a way that it's not thinkable that if you go further into the past, you suddenly meet a thing in itself. Because when you go further into the past, you're gonna meet something temporal. So that can't be a thing in itself. So here's, here's a difference, and it's going to be an important difference for Kant. Okay, so what does he say here? Um, just before A530, Kant says this. This distinction comes to be important and opens for us an entirely new prospect in regard to the suit in which reason has become implicated. Whereas up to now it has been dismissed as based on false presuppositions on both sides, now perhaps in the dynamical antinomy, there is a presupposition that can coexist with the pretensions of reason. And since the judge may make good to the facts in legal grounds that have been misconstrued on both sides, the case can be mediated to the satisfaction of both parties, which could not be done in the controversy about the mathematical antinomy. So Kant uses this legal, this legal metaphor about a suit and a judge and so on and so forth. The idea is that, okay, yeah, people in, these, in this third and fourth conflict were wrong, Right? Their arguments didn't work. But maybe we can sort of reinterpret their claims in such a way that they both end up being happy. That we have causation and that we have natural causation and freedom. Um, that we have like pure contingency in the world of appearances and some kind of necessary ground. And this is possible because these are things that are not homogenous. Uh, not necessarily homogenous in the way that I explained a couple of minutes before. So here we have at the bottom of A530. Hence it is that in the mathematical connection of series of appearances, none other than a sensible condition can enter. That is only one that is itself a part of the series. Whereas the dynamic series of sensible conditions, on the contrary, allows a, fur allows a further condition different in kind, one that is not a part of the series, but as merely intelligible lies outside the series. In this way, reason can be given satisfaction and the unconditioned can be posited prior to appearances without confounding the series of appearances uh, and without any violation of principles of the understanding. And so Kant ends up saying that maybe in, these, in this third and fourth uh, conflict, both the thesis and the antithesis are true. So in the first and second conflict, the thesis and the antithesis were both false. In the third and fourth conflict, perhaps both are true. Kant is not gonna say both are true because he's not going to be able to prove or even prove the possibility of these intelligible things standing in these relations of causation or grounding to you know what is here in the world, but at least it's thinkable. Right, at least it's thinkable. And this opens up uh, the possibility for, for faith on, on practical grounds, as Kant is going to tell us, or in a sense has already told us. So section three, which is uh, definitely the longest, um, which is about freedom, right? Here Kant is going to explain his theory of freedom. And um, this is actually like most of this section nine. So let's see what Kant is going to do. Well, the basic idea is this. On the one hand, we know, we have seen this in the, in the analytic, we know um, that everything must have a natural cause, right? That, that, that the world of, of nature, the world of appearances, is governed by these iron-bound laws of causation. Because otherwise, there's no coherent nature, things can't be placed in time, uh, and so on and so forth. And just to take away one, one possible misunderstanding, um, if you do have the Geyer and Wood translation that I have, and you have the edition that I have, 
than what you're going to find at the bottom of page 534 is a phrase that says, um, and will suffer violation. And this should be, and will suffer no violation. So the very bottom line of page 534, there must be the word no between suffer and violation. Es leidet keinen Abfall. All right. So um, no violation. By the way, also the page numbers, the, the A and B page numbers on this page in the Gaia Roots translation are now formed. Okay, so how does this work? So on the one hand, we have nature, and nature has this strict law of causation, and that seems to mean that there can't be any freedom, right? That, that I, as a human being, cannot be my own cause. Um, whatever I do is going to be conditioned by things that happened earlier. And Kant thinks that that is true, insofar as we are just looking at the world of appearances. But we can posit, and maybe we even have some reason to posit, because, um, well, let me first say what we can posit. We can posit uh, ourselves also as intelligible beings, right? As beings who are not just appearances. And we have good reason to do that, Kant seems to be saying, because we also know ourselves in ways that do not require sensibility. Right? We know ourselves as transcendental apperception. We know ourselves as this thinking, reasoning I, um, that this synthesizing I, that, okay, I mean, it's not any substantial knowledge, but, but it's, it's some grasp we have of ourselves. And this means that we are not just appearances, right? I mean, that would be weird if we are just appearances that appear to ourselves. That doesn't really even make any sense. Right? So we have at least some reason to posit ourselves, to think of ourselves as not just appearances, but also these intelligible beings. And so maybe, Kant says, as intelligible beings, we cause in a special way, like let's call it intelligible causation, we intelligibly cause our actions, um, even though Obviously, we're only seeing and, 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 you know, empirically investigating those actions as appearances in the world in which they stand under the causal law that binds them to an, you know, endless chain of prior appearances that are the causes that led to them. So Kant is really pushing, uh, in a sense, a kind of compatibilism here. He is claiming that, yes, on the one hand, this natural world of appearances is just this like totally maybe deterministic world, this, this chain of cause and effect, and every action that you see is something that is the result of the entire chain of past events um, and had to happen in the way that it did. Yes, absolutely. But there is another perspective possible, a perspective that thinks of us as intelligible beings causing in a way that we can't really grasp, but nevertheless causing that entire chain of appearances, really, right? So it is possible for us to think, to believe that this chain of appearances of which our actions are parts is in one way or another, which we cannot possibly empirically investigate, uh, caused by the nature of our own intelligible being. And although we cannot prove that this is the case, uh, and although we can't even really show that this is a, a like coherent in the sense of like metaphysically possible uh, a scenario, at least it makes some logical sense. At least nobody can say that we are wrong when we do this, right? So at least this possibility is open. So Kant tells us at A537 that the effect can therefore be regarded as free in regard to its intelligible cause and yet simultaneously in regard to appearances as their result according to the necessity of nature. And he says, well, this must appear extremely subtle and obscure, but in its application, it will be enlightening. Um, now, Kant tells us in the next little subsection, the possibility of causality through freedom unified with the universal law of natural necessity. 
he introduces some terminology. He's talking about our empirical character and our intelligible character. Um, and says at the bottom of A539, now this acting subject in its intelligible character would not stand under any conditions of time. For time is only the condition of appearances, but not of things in themselves. In that subject, no action would arise or perish. Hence, it would not be subject to the law of everything alterable in its time determination that everything that happens must find its cause in the appearances. So, as intelligible character, uh, we are outside of the necessities of nature. So, we also don't stand under those laws. That makes freedom possible. At the same time, it means that, wow, this is pretty weird, right? I mean, it's not even a temporal self that we are talking about, right? We have totally have to abstract from everything that has to do with the world of appearances. Uh, so this is not even a temporal self. This is not a self that is in time, that works in time, that changes over time. Um, so our grasp of this self is necessarily very, very incomplete. Right? As we have seen in the entire critique, and especially, of course, in the paralogism, um, but also, I guess, in the deduction, our grasp of our sort of transcendental, non-empirical self is, is really merely as this unity that underlies the empirical unity, uh, the unity of appearances. That is also sort of the only grasp that we are going to have here of this free self. Right? It is somehow what underlies all our actions, that of which our empirical character is the sensible reflection, the sensible effect. But, you know, how exactly we are, we are to understand it, um, there's, there's basically nothing that, that could be said about that. And so Kant ends this subsection by saying that freedom and nature each in its full significance would both be found in the same actions simultaneously and without any contradiction according to whether one compares them with their intelligible or their sensible cause. Kant is going to spend some time explaining things more to us and so for instance he tells us at the bottom of A544 that we need the principle of the causality of appearances in order to be able to seek for and specify the natural conditions that is causes in appearance for natural occurrences. This is the speculative or theoretical use of reason, right? I mean, this, this natural causation is absolutely needed for reason itself in its speculative use. But we're gonna learn uh, a couple of pages further when it comes to the practical use, right, that's when we need freedom. So, A546, at the bottom of that page. Yet the human being, who is otherwise acquainted with the whole of nature solely through sense, knows himself also through pure apperception, and indeed in actions and inner determinations which cannot be accounted at all among impressions of sense. He obviously is in one part phenomenon, but in another part, namely in regard to certain faculties, he is, merely, he is a merely intelligible object, because the actions of this object cannot at all be ascribed to the receptivity of sensibility. We call these faculties understanding and reason. So this is where I, I told you that Kant says, look, we already know of ourselves that we are not just appearances, right? We are something else too. Now that this reason has causality, or that we can at least represent something of the sort in it, is clear from the imperatives that we propose as rules to our powers of execution in everything practical. Right? We, we think already of this intelligible being as having causal influence, as being able to affect things because we posit the moral law, right? we posit imperatives. We think of ourselves as somebody who ought to do certain things. Well, this ought is only applicable to intelligible things. It makes no sense to say about things in the world that they ought to do something or that they ought to be a certain way. If I say fire ought not hurt me, that just doesn't make any sense, right? It's not the right kind of thing. Appearances don't fall under imperatives. But intelligible free beings could fall under imperatives. 
And so Kant here is pointing out that we, we already think of ourselves as not just appearance, that we already think of ourselves as causing things in a non-natural sense. Um, and so it's not as abstract. His story actually fits our, our traditional story. So we can actually predict all human actions if we were to investigate them empirically. Absolutely. Kant is not, he's, he's a compatibilist, right? He's not claiming that um, noumenal causation is interrupts the way that the world works. No, the causally ordered way that the world works is somehow an effect, right? The entire causally ordered structure of the world is somehow an effect of this noumenal realm, which on the hypothesis that we are considering includes um, includes these intelligible human selves, these noumenal selves that are transcendentally free. There's a fascinating footnote on A551 where Kant emphasizes that we don't know this self. Um, and I'll say something about that after I pause this video for a moment. So as I was saying, a fascinating footnote at A551 where Kant says this, the real morality of actions, their merit and guilt, even that of our own conduct, therefore remains entirely hidden from us. Our imputations can be referred only to the empirical character. How much of it is to be ascribed to mere nature and innocent defects of temperament, or to his happy constitution, this no one can discover, and hence no one can judge it with complete justice. Right? Even, even of our own actions, we can't really know in how far uh, and in what sense our intelligible self is responsible for them, is the cause of them. And so you, can't, you can never really judge anyone else or even yourself. Um, I think this is a fascinating thought and something that, um, um, that if we want to understand Kant's moral philosophy, right, and how it fits into the critical system as a whole, this, uh, I would say, is an important, a really important point to investigate uh, and try to understand right, what does this even mean for our own for our own moral conduct, right? If we don't, if we don't even really know why we acted the way that we acted, hmm, right? Does does that does that have any implications for morality? Well, I'm not going to delve into that now because Kant is not going to delve into that now. But I do think it's fascinating. Let's see. Kant sort of repeats some of these points, such as that the intelligible character. Um, does not is not is not temporal, right? It's this totally transcendent element of the story. And then, and I think this is kind of clarifying. At a five hundred and fifty four and a five hundred and fifty five, uh, he applies the story to a, a kind of a kind of example, right? Somebody who who does some malicious lying, and Kant says, well, you know, we can we can set out all these empirical causes of their conduct. Right, that they had a bad youth and bad friends and you know this and that and such and so. And he says, now, even if one believes the action to be determined by these causes, one nonetheless blames the agent, and not on account of his unhappy natural temper, not on account of the circumstances influencing him, not even on account of the life he has led previously, um, but rather you know, that this deed could be regarded as entirely unconditioned in regard to the previous state as though with that act the agent had started a series of consequences entirely from himself. Right? So in holding people blameworthy, in thinking about guilt, we are presupposing this kind of transcendental freedom, which is in no way um, which is in no way harmed, which is in no way lessened even by the fact that there is this entire chain of empirical conditions. I'm not sure that this is right. Because it seems to me that there definitely are some empirical conditions that would uh, make us believe that the agent is not really guilty. Um, there are all kinds of circumstances where we think that the agent is not really guilty. And it's not easy to see how Kant is going to allow us to make that kind of distinction if we have no grasp of this noumenal causal relation. Um, I mean, how can we then grasp when it is active and when it is not active. So again, all kinds of fascinating questions and problems 
are generated here by the Kantian story about freedom and morality. And Kant ends section three by uh, asserting once again that he hasn't shown that transcendental freedom is real. He hasn't even shown that it's possible. All that he has shown is that it doesn't conflict, that it is in some logical sense at least compatible with the chain of causes in nature. Section four doesn't bring us a lot of new stuff. It's, it's quite short and we have seen sort of the main things at a, at a slightly less abstract level in section three. Uh, here Kant says, well, you know, we can have the same kind of thing when we think about the existence of things. Um, sure, when we think of that in, in the world of appearances, we're never gonna find anything unconditioned, but we can posit something unconditioned outside of, of the world of appearances which sort of grounds, which is the foundation of um, all these contingent things in the natural world. We can do that. Again, we don't know whether it's true. We don't even really know whether it's possible, but it's something that we can posit. In fact, reason kind of, kind of forces us to posit it, but in a way that doesn't even happen when we think of the chain of causations. Here, the idea that everything in the world is just contingent, that, that doesn't really, that, that is almost, impossible for reason to accept right surely something something must be not contingent something must be necessary um hmm well you know that leads to the idea of a necessary being a highest being a god and so Kant says here we have a great reason to go on with the third part of the antinomy which is the or chapter three of the second book of the uh, transcendental dialectic i should not say the third part of the antinomy um, because it's no longer the antinomy, we had the paralogisms, we had the antinomy, and now we have the ideal of pure reason, which is about the highest being or the necessary being. And so that is what we are going to look at next time.